Okay, time to get things rolling. Very good morning to you all from a slightly cloudy but still very pleasant San Francisco. Uh, my name is Simon Thompson. I'm on the product marketing team here at uh, Meraki headquarters and welcome along to uh, spring 2016 and the Meraki quarterly. So uh, if you've not attended one of these before, this is a webinar with a little bit of a difference. This one's really, uh, really intended to be directed at more established uh, folks who are used to the Meraki platform already, maybe not brand new to it, because we're not going to be uh, starting from scratch here. We're going to be assuming that you already know Meraki pretty well. Of course, we have a whole range of webinars to get you up to speed if you are new to Meraki, so uh, please feel free to stay with us. Uh, but uh, basically, this is really all about giving the product managers an opportunity to speak to you all uh, once every quarter to give uh, effectively an update and a, and a recap of what's been happening over the last uh, calendar quarter. So uh, let's get things started straight away. The agenda looks a little bit like this. We are going to start off with our security appliances this morning. Uh, we'll then go into the wonderful switchy line. Uh, we'll have a look at some mobile device management updates. And we'll also, of course, speak to, uh, to Matt on wireless. We'll have time for question and answers at the end. And I am running a machine in the room with uh, Q&A on there as well. So if you have questions as they come in, please, no questions about roadmap, because we'll probably just ignore those. Uh, but any questions you may have about the material we're presenting today, uh, just feel free to tap away. We'll try and get those questions answered for you as quickly and effectively as we can. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand across to Raviv to get us started on MX. Thank you very much, Simon. Very nice to be here with uh, all of the nice guys in the room and the audience far away. This is my uh, first uh, webinar with Meraki. I've joined the company late uh, last year as the product manager responsible for the MX product line. And I have a few interesting things to share with you guys today. Starting with the introduction of AMP, Cisco's Advanced Malware Protection. AMP and AMP Threat Grid are coming to MX. This has been uh, long anticipated, and everyone is very, very excited about that. AMP is an anti-malware solution that we're going to integrate in MX. It is going to replace the current um, malware protection solution that we have in place. AMP is an amazing technology, has made some uh, significant traction in the market, pretty much front line of the security technology today. I got to Cisco by the acquisition of uh, Sourcefire. The unique thing about AMP is not only the huge cloud-based database of uh, malicious signatures that we can compare files against, file signatures against, but also the fact that we are able to retrospectively analyze files. So usually when it comes to malware protection, uh, a file disposition can either be clean, unknown, or malicious. In the case that the file disposition is unknown, which definitely can happen with any malware protection solution, we can, up to two weeks later on, notify the users in dashboard and by email that a malicious file was downloaded downloaded into their system and then take action on that. So this is an amazing technology that we're very excited to have. I, I urge you to go to our uh, blog to read more about that. Um, the AMP technology would be available for free with every MX that has an advanced security license. We are having a public beta right now for MX, for uh, AMP, I'm sorry, and I urge you all to just check the beta, um, beta updates box in your dashboard or to call support and just ask to get on that beta. A, a potential upgrade for AMP that we would be rolling later on this year would be the AMP thread grid. Using AMP Thread Grid, we are going to enable submission of actual files with unknown disposition to be sandboxed and potentially detonated. That's the uh, technical term to try and understand whether or not the file is malicious or not. So even files which disposition is currently unknown for the AMP cloud or files that are malicious and have been tailored to attack a specific organization. There's no other way to know that this file is malicious rather than to try it out. And that's something that we will be supporting as well, um, launching later this year. 
just to provide uh, maybe a short uh, description on how it works. So we have the MX. We have a user that is downloading a file from the internet in, through the MX. The file is being inspected through the AMP agent in the MX, and the signature of that file is being checked with the AMP cloud for the disposition. The AMP cloud is constantly updated by um, approximately over one million new uh, malicious signatures every day. The file is checked. If, if the file disposition is unknown and the network, the organization, has a thread grid subscription in place as well, we are checking the file itself, sending the actual file to the thread grid on perm appliance or the thread grid cloud-based appliance for it to be further checked. At that point in time, if the file is determined to be malicious, the AMP cloud is being updated and so is the specific network admin. So that means that even if you don't use ThreadGrid, other ThreadGrid appliances are constantly working on finding new and dangerous malicious files, and the AMP cloud is getting updated, and you will enjoy that increased level of security as well. The next thing that I'd like to talk about that we are very excited uh, to introduce is the new security center that you will be able to enjoy as soon as you call support and join the AMP public base. What we offer there is a single pane of glass, kind of a Miraki tradition, that shows all security events coming currently from the IPS IDS small base solution that we have, as well as the AMP um, anti-malware protection, advanced malware protection that I've introduced before. Using that single page in dashboard, you are able to see the threats that your network is exposed to, to double click into specific threats, specific users, um, see which uh, geographies the threats are coming for, from, and, and so on and so forth. Really cool stuff, I urge you guys to take a look. I'm doing my time. Good so far? Awesome. So another uh, couple of interesting uh, announcements or uh, news that we have uh, gone under the works here. The MX65 and the MX65W products have been announced earlier this year. Pretty similar to the MX64 in performance, but very, very different when it comes to port count. You can see the uh, back panel in the picture in front of you right now. So we have um, 12 ports altogether. Um, two for uh, uplinks, ideal for IWAN, eight LANs, and two LAN ports with PoE. So we are very, very excited about that. With that device, we are also announcing um, dot one x port authentication that would be supported on that device as well as the MX64. Um, and the MX64. And this device is this these products are available right now and finally a quick uh, call for action so I, I mentioned the amp beta um, the amp beta is available right now on your mx device this is not amp, amp for endpoints this is just for the mx device every http downloaded file would be scanned using amp just call support get it um, for future features that you would like to try out and be the first to, to see, I urge you guys to go into dashboard, um, network, general, configure, um, try beta firmware. Just check that box, say yes, and you would be getting our latest fully tested beta versions with the newest feature. So that, that, that's pretty awesome. I'm using that at home, no complaints from the wife. So I, I strongly urge you guys to <laughs> go about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so I urge you guys to, to go and, and try that. And final piece of news, um, we've started a new program to provide free MX devices to qualified attendees for the Miraki MX introduction webinar. We, we're having that on what? Is it a quarter or? Very soon. Very soon. So we have one for April 20. It may be full, but there's another one that's going to be announced after that. Go ahead and enjoy your free MX device. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Raviv. Uh, we have had a couple of questions come in around uh, around the AMP announcement. Uh, what we'll do is we'll circle back on those towards the end of the session. So we'll let Tony get on with switching.
Very good. Thank you, Simon. And sounds like a lot of exciting stuff going on there, uh, Raviv. I also see what you're doing there, adding more and more switch ports to your MX devices, um, trying to steal a little bit of that revenue away from our team here. But uh, hey, we're, we're all Meraki. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks so much. Uh, and it, as Simon said, it's an absolute pleasure for all of us uh, to have you here. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting ground to cover on the switch portfolio. So let's jump right in. We announced and introduced new member to the MS400 series family. And this product uh, or t a pair of products is really designed for very basic, uh, medium to large size branches, as well as those campuses and campus type environments that either have older fiber backbone um, that, that can't necessarily support uh, 10 gig, for example, or the, the need just simply isn't there for 10 gig backbone. And this is an exciting product just because of the fact that, you know, we really follow our uh, very high class industrial design on this product. You can see it's very similar in look and feel to the rest of the families. Uh, and again, very basic and straightforward, but very, very powerful product nonetheless. Um, you, here you can see a snapshot of the back. Uh, it does have dedicated 160 gigabit backplane stackable ports, so this means that you can choose, if you'd like to do so, to stack two or more together, up eight, um, and really have a very, very nice uh, solid performance uh, uh, backbone to your network. It also comes with hot swappable fans, hot swappable power supply, so really designed to be a, a high availability product. A couple of other things to note, you'll see that we uh, placed a management port on this product. Part of this is because the front is all SFP, and so we want to make it very easy for our customers to be able to diagnose if there's anything going on or also just bring it up and set it up. Here's a quick uh, snapshot of what the models are, the MS41016 and 32. You can see the price points, and again, these are stackable. So very, very exciting addition, and really completing the aggregation story for us here at Meraki in that we now have both a 1 and 10 gig flavor of fiber aggregation. These are perfect for your distribution layer. Uh, they are fully layer 3 capable. They support technologies HA, and uh, pairing, and as, as I said, the 410 has stackable interfaces. The 420, which is really a 10 gig fiber aggregation product, um, what we're working on right now, and this is coming very, very soon, is the ability to be able to take any of those front ports and turn them into stacking ports. This is very similar to the technology on the Catalyst line called VSS, and this is something that we're hard at work on. Expect to hear an update there very, very soon. Moving right along, we have another very, very exciting feature announcement. This is something that our team uh, on the software side has been working on for quite some time. Um, and what the announcement is, is switch templates. Now, th those of you familiar with some of our other products in the portfolio may have known that we have template ability on the MX and MR already. Really, this completes the full stack story when it comes to managing any set of Meraki hardware at scale. And this is an incredibly cool feature. It allows for you to go in, define your golden configuration for all of your switches, whether it's 10 or 10,000, bind those switches to that golden configuration, and you're off to the races. There is no further configuration needed. Now, there's an additional few benefits that you get by leveraging this feature, the first of which, of course, is rapid provisioning. So getting things up and getting things ready to rock and roll and making sure that they're all compliant, right? So making sure that every switch is the same. However, we realize and recognize that there is no such thing as a perfect network. So if you have 999 stores that are configured perfectly, you're going to have one that needs some kind of different config. And that's where we allow for you to do local overrides. So you can have a baseline with your template and you can then go in and modify one of the ports as necessary. Very, very flexible, very, very easy. However, for those of you in the retail industry, uh, you may be you know, thinking through how do I make sure I'm compliant, and that probably takes up quite a bit of time and overhead for your team today. Another benefit of switch templates is that it allows for you to immediately audit your entire install base, make sure it's running the latest software and up to date, and also be able to immediately audit your entire install base's configuration. You can say, 
are all my switches configured identically and which ones are not, you can receive alerts. It's a very, very powerful feature and a very powerful story. This is a quick visualization of how this actually works. You can see that at the top of this configuration you have a network template. This contains settings like firmware, time zones, and whether or not you want to turn on network-wide capabilities such as spanning tree, quality of service, etc. You can also define things like 802.1x policies and other security type settings at the network level, which would apply to any of your local networks that are actually bound to this template. There's an additional layer then where we allow for you to create one or more switch profiles. These represent the real switches in your various locations. And this is where you get into the nitty gritty of say ports one through 10 are access ports, ports 11 through 24 are trunk for your access points, for example. I'd like to take a quick moment to demonstrate to you what this actually looks like in Dashboard. And again, this is fully available. We announced it about a month ago. Um, those of you who are just hearing about it, I highly encourage you to check it out. It is absolutely one of the cooler features we've got today for the Switch product. You can see here I have a nice template. It's named copy and paste. You can see it as a switch type template. And if I select it, it's actually going to take me to the point where I can bind networks to it and configure it. Now from here, it's really about selecting the template and then choosing how I want to define that network as a whole um, so that all of the various local networks that are bound to it get configured that way. And it starts off by doing some very, very basic settings. And these could entail, as I said, things like quality of service that you want, uh, the rules you want to apply to the entire deployment and other various network-wide settings. At that point, you really, as I said, get into more of the profiling, and this is where it gets fun, because you can create one or more of these profiles. And as you can see here, I have a store switch profile, and I also have a security camera switch profile. You may have the need for various switches that facilitate different use cases in these environments. And so you can define multiple. And depending on the model you select, we actually provide configurability on this profile. So you can actually manipulate this profile as if it were a real living, breathing switch. Now, once you set this all up and you're happy with it, that is where you can actually begin to bind the switches in your organization. Now, this is a quick test and example network here. And you can see I don't have any to bind. But if I had an install base today, I would see the list of switches that matched this model type. I would be able to bind them. And that is all I have to do to configure that install base. Very, very, very cool feature. Those of you who have any questions on this or you want to learn a little bit more, we have a very powerful dis the deployment guide on this particular feature. It is a power user feature. Um, so you can you know, obviously configure a lot of switches and ports in mass. But it is power user in that you can also make changes once you've deployed. So if you wanted to, say, make a change on port 1 on 1,000 switches, all of which are bound to the template, you change the profile, the propagation takes place. So very, very cool, very powerful feature. With that, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it off to my friend and colleague, Paul, who's going to talk to you about Systems Manager. Thank you all so much. Good stuff, Tony. Thanks for the introduction. Howdy, everybody. My name is Paul Wolf, and I'm one of the product specialists for Systems Manager. Yeah, the wolf. And I'm also the excited, excitable one. Um, pretty much all the time, I'm very, very excited over here. Everybody's giving me weird faces now. This is the, yeah, I'm like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Um, so I'm here to give you the Systems Manager update. A lot of things to go over. Uh, some of these will go over pretty quick and then actually tab over to Dashboard as well, just like Tony did, and show off a few of the things that we have there. Yeah, someone, someone, Ann is on right now. She just called me out on there. It's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, first up is iOS 9.3. This has been a very hot topic in enterprise mobility management, MDM, uh, all over the world. This is obviously Apple specific, but it's really brought a lot of functionality that's pretty cool. Um, what this does is this basically allows you to do a whole new myriad of things. It's like you can configure devices to be shared iPads, and then you can push user profiles to them. And you can configure classroom apps, and the classroom app can get everything from here's a list of students, here, is, here are the classrooms that they're a part of, here's the teacher that are, teachers that are supposed to be able to administer them, 
And then basically when these devices have local access, they'll do Bluetooth discovery, they'll detect each other, they do some cool stuff with BLE and talking to us over managed app config and all these things. And then your teacher is allowed to control all the devices that are in the classroom. It'll show you everyone that's online, um, and then you can assign an iPad, like in case you're not into one-to-one, -one, you have these, again, shared scenario. You can assign iPad, you can lock them out, you can clear the passcode, uh, you can actually view their screen as well. And, and then a whole other mess of things that you can do, along with N9.3, you can actually create a home screen layout. You can also hide and show any app side settings. So this becomes really powerful when you look at what we do with tagging. Um, the fact that we can make it so based off of whatever user you're logged in as or geofencing status or security compliance, any of these things, you can automatically hide and, and show apps. And that's better than removing them in the case where you're not worried about data loss because now you can just hide the app so nobody has access. And then what you can do is maybe if they're back in security compliance or when they're back on site, you show the apps and you actually don't have to re-download those. This is just legitimately hiding them on the device, making it so you can't access it. Uh, and anyway, there are a lot of things with 9.3 that, that are making this even more interesting in the Apple front. Other things that have happened on the Apple front is our OS 10 enhancements. Uh, so you may have seen seen what we're working on there, but we have dozens of new systems preferences. We've added file vault disk encryption that you can use institutional recovery key or both. Um, and then it just gives you a lot more control, flexibility, as well as a lot more security on OS 10 um, devices there too. And another one that's really cool that what I'll do, oops, let's actually tab over. What I'll do is I'll show you another cool feature that we have that we release in iOS 9. I hop over to our network. Now this one is pretty special, I'd like to say. It makes it extremely easy to make sure that your devices are up to date and to push OS level updates to your, to your devices remotely and in bulk. So let's look for example here, this is, we're on our corporate network. If I wanna look up all of our iPads, I can actually just check all of these iPads check the box for all these iPads. I submit a command here. Uh, we're on a read-only account, so I can't do it, but basically I could just hit the command and then you can push an OS level update to all these devices. And what they do is we're gonna reach out, we're gonna tell the devices to download them automatically, uh, and they're gonna download the newest OS version and then it's just going to install them on there. It couldn't be more easy to make it so that all your devices have the new security standards, they have the new security patches, bug fixes, and also this new functionality on things that we released with 9.3. So that's a really cool one. We we're also first to market with that feature. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that one out. All right, moving on. So last thing I'll say on the Apple front is we also have uh, the ability to set wallpaper as well. And it basically looks, if you see over here, you have a lock screen and a home screen that you can add onto there. And this will change, as you would assume, the lock screen or home screen accordingly to whatever you want it to be. And we have this cool example use case here that again, if you look at what we do with dynamic tagging, it becomes really interesting. A good example of that is you can maybe set time or location to say if a device leaves like this location, it leaves the site, and it's very excited about that, good. Uh, if it leaves the site, then what you can do is have it automatically apply wallpaper. So let's say this is a retail chain or this is education, government facility, someplace where it's not supposed to leave. You can A, with those uh, geofencing and security compliance, you can have it remove all the data off of there, anything that we've provisioned to make it secure. But you can now also set a wallpaper. So now the lock screen, since there's a passcode, since they can't get into the device, they wouldn't be able to see who to return it to. Lock screen can be something like, this device has been lost or stolen, please return to so-and-so. Or in the case where it's security compliance, you can see what we did here, where it's something's wrong, please contact IT. You can also see another thing that we've seen pretty commonly in education is they'll lock it into single app mode, update the wallpapers, things like this, to just basically say, like, you've been bad, tail between the legs, come and see us, something like that. So anyway, you can see uh, a lot of the things that you have that you can add, that you can add, that you can use uh, along with all these dynamic policies and different things like that. All right, now this was a huge one, our Android update with uh, Android for work. So now this is, this brings a lot of very powerful functionality to the Android world. 
uh, that we're really, really excited to partner with Google on bringing, bringing out into the world. And so basically, what this is going to do is this, gonna, this is going to make it so that you have native containerization and also the ability to create multiple accounts on the device. So as you can see in these screenshots here, you have these little, this little badge icon. The other thing that you can notice is there's two versions of Chrome on there and Mail. So one of those has the badge. It's going to be an Android for work. The other one is not. It's on the private side. So a couple things that are really cool with Android for work. One, it's encrypted by default. If you have a, a for work profile, the whole device is going to be encrypted. You know it's safe. You also know that everything on your badge side is going to be in, the, in a different container than the private. So now you can have two accounts, you can have your personal email on there, you can have the Android for work or your work email on the Android for work side, and then we can wipe the things that are in that Android for work container, leave the private container uh, untouched and unable to talk to the work container. So good stuff there too. Yep, and so the a huge use case that we see for this is BYOD. Um, basically, if you have a device that comes in, you absolutely want to separate these things. Uh, it, of course, you can't. It's not just for BYOD. You can use it. This is for work across the board because it makes it a lot easier to manage. Gives you more functionality. But this is a very common use case for this. You know, you want them to come in, in the iOS world. You can have them enroll and then use something like Open End Management to separate private and uh, business data. But now you have this with Android for Work, where it has this separate encrypted container. Um, it's really completing that story that you'd want to tell around Android. All right, the last thing that I want to talk about is a little bit that we've added from Windows 10. So what we did here, I mean, as you know, Meraki, we do cloud really well. We also do networking and device management, visibility, all these things really well. And anything that we can do to marry those, the better. Uh, you've probably seen our entire Sentry uh, feature set that allows you to integrate your mobile devices with the network. And then what, so one thing that we're doing here is we added more things on the systems manager side to help with provisioning devices to be able to connect to the network. So one here that you can see that's really important, if you look at systems manager Sentry Wi-Fi security, we have now extended that to Windows 10. So this now makes it so that all of your devices, when they come on, they enroll in Systems Manager, and then we can also push them out EAP TLS, uh, 802.1x uh, profile, as well as the certificate they need to connect to that. So now, even before the device gets on site, you can actually have them pre-provisioned with it. And then again, if you look at those dynamic tags that we have, you can also have them, if they violate security compliance, they're not running antivirus. Uh, you can make that as granular as specifically, maybe they're not currently running Kaspersky. Anything like that, we can actually tri trigger an uninstall. They lose the certificates, they lose access to the network, or they get access to a different part of the network. Uh, it all becomes very seamless, very secure, and a really cool, um, pretty cool functionality that you can use. Everybody looked at me because I paused there for a second. We're wondering what else is coming. I know. Cool it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Again, I'm excited though. But uh, all right. Well, good stuff. Quick, I mean, quick, quick question. Quick question. Is, would, would it be possible to like set up a policy, say, based on geofencing, so that when you're in the building, I can shut off the notifications on your iPhone so that you can't get any messages from Anne distracting you during the presentation? You know what? I'm very glad that you asked that question, and yes, you absolutely can. So now with iOS 9, you actually do have the ability to change app settings on notifications. So you can basically change it so it's like, hey, Paul's in the webinar. You should probably get less distracted. <laughs> so I love this feature. We could turn those off. <laughs> uh, All right. With that, I mean, I just had to insert my own question, and I totally jumped the question queue, which is piling up for the uh, the end of the show. But exactly. Thanks, thanks exactly. for uh, for putting up with me. Yeah. And hey, so the man who needs no introduction over here, ladies and gentlemen, Matt. Welcome, welcome, welcome to last quarter in MR. I'm your product manager, Matt Landry. We just have time for a few quick things to go over. It's been, uh, it's been a while since we were here, and a lot has happened, obviously, across the entire portfolio, but, uh, you know, I, I tend to pay more attention, maybe, uh, maybe more than is due to MR. I don't, I don't know. I enjoy it. And uh, you may remember, if you tuned in about three months ago, that there was this mention of a Meraki developers portal. And at the time, it was locked up behind a password. It had a... Uh, 
a web address you had to remember, and then a password you also had to remember in order to get to it. And uh, my colleague Colin showed it off, and it was great. And since then, we have had unbelievable uh, acceptance of this platform because it is the way that we are able to demonstrate that a Meraki network that can, uh, comprises MR, MS, SM, MX, all of the pieces is much more than just a piece of infrastructure, much more than just a network that you're building, but it is truly a business platform mm. that you can build out. And we want to make this uh, available for everybody to understand, to discover new solutions to learn how to build new services based on the many APIs that we've made available on the Meraki platform. And so we've opened up developers.meraki.com site to everyone to access. Now, if you have developed a, a third-party application that you want to integrate with the Meraki network, you can sign up as a Meraki developer there. We can, uh, if you have some ideas and you want to try it out, we can get you some gear to try it out. And if you have a customer or you are a customer, you want to discover what's possible, what services have already been built, what different use cases are there, this is all available on the Meraki Developers Portal. We're very, very excited about this. We've had an unbelievable response to people signing up as Meraki developers, as technology partners. There's a lot of rich content on there. And uh, it's just been a great couple months since we opened this up to the public. And uh, you know, we, we're, we're really excited to bring it to you. And I can't wait to see what additional signups come in and uh, interest for use cases come through. Not only that, but we introduced an entirely new access point. A website wasn't enough. We wanted to actually build some hardware, too. <laughs> and, and I know, Paul, you don't get to build too much hardware these days, no. you know, being a, a software-only product. So, you know, we get to enjoy the new hardware, and that's why we're proud to introduce. And you can take all our shipping costs. Th that's right. That's right. We, we actually charge for each SM license that you ship. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, all joking aside, the MR42 802.11ac Wave 2 access point uh, was introduced in February. And uh, this is a Wave 2 AP, 3x3 three three with three spatial streams, supporting the critical Wave 2 feature of multi-user MIMO. And I won't go into the technical details of multi-user MIMO here, but the basic concept is that uh, you can have a much more efficient use of your personal mobile devices by uh, using them simultaneously over the air instead of having to speak with them one by one. Multi-user MIMO is amazing. We have the dedicated scanning rate, which comes on all of our access points. It uh, enables features like Air Marshal, Auto RF, and uh, the CMX location analytics. And Joe wants me to call it Moo MIMO or multi cow MIMO, and I don't know where I'm supposed to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he likes Moo, Moo MIMO. Um, you know, I'm not sure. There's, there's actually a bit of a religious war about whether you say Moo, M-U, Mu MIMO. It's a tough one. So we're, we'll, we'll get that sorted at the end of this session, Joe, definitely. Uh, we also have a Bluetooth low energy radio integrated into this access point. So we've been able to take uh, the same form factor, the same uh, power limits of the MR34. We've been able to stuff all of these radios and capability into there and fit into the same sleek industrial design that we've, uh, we've introduced with the MR34 and the MR32. And again, this launched on the 9th of February. This is uh, one of the best selling, one of the most popular, one of the most capable access points that we've put on the market. I'm very, very excited about it. And ultimately, this set of functionality is uh, helping us set the standard for what Wave 2 Wireless really means. I also want to give you a bit of a sneak peek into some upcoming MR capabilities. Just this week, we have uh, progressed to public beta with a uh, new firmware that has critical new functionality for posturing and login using a, a feature called Radius COA. And what that really means is that we can enable deeper integration with Cisco ICE, the Cisco Identity Services Engine. Now, I've got uh, a strangely colored table here that uh, shows various features and functionality that Cisco Identity Services Engine, ICE, like we uh, like to call it, that is possible with ICE. And up until now, the compatibility has been reason, you know, small amount of supported, a bit of partial, so partial support in different uh, profiling and posturing modes, and then some unsupported capabilities uh, on Cisco ICE. And with the introduction of this new beta firmware, we're able to turn this into complete support for all of the critical use cases for Cisco ICE, uh, particularly being able to use virtual web auth in, in order to get devices onboarded for BYOD policies, in order to uh, assess the posturing and profiling of those devices and get them onboarded onto your network. ICE isn't the only thing. 
There are also a number of other NAC solutions that are out in the field from uh, companies like Bradford Networks, Packet Fence, Four Scouts, uh, you know, all of which may focus in different areas, different verticals, different uh, businesses that their solution is preferred. And this uh, Radius COA functionality makes it much easier to integrate with these systems as well. So really, across the board, we're able to uh, much expand the functionality of the MRS access points. And that gives us ice, ice, baby. Man, this is just like, the, the jokes are flying here. I love it. Ice, ice, baby is is yeah, no, here no, no, no. to stay. <laughs> right, we, we, we really do need to work on the jokes here, guys. Like, we should probably curse, I'm thinking, and less caffeine. Fewer, fewer Red Bulls. <laughs> now, now, most importantly for all of, all of you who are listening, if you're still listening after this distraction, um, if you'd like to try out this new beta functionality, uh, get a hold of Meraki Support. They can enable this on your network. Uh, speak with your Cisco Meraki uh, SE. They can also enable this on your network. And so you can really try it out and see what it looks like. Now, right now, I'd like to maybe just jump over and show you what it looks like because one of the, uh, one of the critical elements of a Meraki network is making it as easy as possible to configure and manage your network. And I just want to give you an example of what it looks like to set up ICE on a network. Now, ICE itself has a lot of capabilities. It does a lot of things, and it can take a, a fair bit of time in order to figure out exactly how you want to have that configured. And often for other systems that want to integrate with it, it's equally challenging. Now, I want you to see what it looks like in a, uh, I don't know what the dictionary is all about, in a uh, Meraki network, what it would look like to set up a uh, Meraki network to work with ICE. So, for example, I have a, uh, an SSID that I'm configuring here, and I want to perhaps use this as a guest network, and I want to do some posture assessment on the devices before I let them on the network. So I'd set them up to use Mac-based off, so that way the uh, ICE server can just get them approved onto the network into a remediation VLAN initially. That'll bring them to a, that'll bring them to a, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, apparently I don't know how to use the touchpad on this device. <laughs> <laughs> My clicking is stronger than your clicking. <laughs> so you're able to bring the device to a uh, central web auth page so that it can do the posturing, so that it can assess it. And by selecting this radio box, it will uh, define that as hash page. Now here are a couple of the critical, I'm trying to tap very lightly here. I need to configure my radius server, maybe port 1812 and a very a uh, very, very deep secret that I can't tell you right now. Uh, I might want to specify perhaps using the airspace ACL names for the attributes. And um, then the other critical step is open up the walled garden so that we can make sure that the client can reach this, uh, this splash page. And now this last step is absolutely the most critical. You have to save. And I can't show you that because this is a read-only account. But that's it. You have two radio buttons specify your radius server, and you're done. You have this working. Now that was for device posturing. What if I wanted to use the central web auth in order to use uh, maybe say AD credentials or some other login system that ICE enables? Well, it's as simple as saying, use WPA2 Enterprise with my radius server. Again, configured for Cisco ICE ICE Baby, have the radius server set up and save it. You're done, it just works, it's that easy. So within seconds, you can configure a Meraki wireless network to use the Cisco Identity Services Engine in order to onboard guests and corporate users. That's it. So very quickly, before we wrap up, I wanted to point out something that I, I found to be pretty cool, snow notwithstanding. This is a uh, recently released case study showing uh, the Meraki wireless deployment uh, on the Matterhorn. This is amazing. And sure enough, we've got an action photo here in at Zermatt. We've got a, an, an access point, an MR72, very beautifully positioned at the top of a, uh, of a building surrounded by snow using its extended temperature range. This is beautiful. And, and I realized I really like to see pictures like this. So with that, I want to see what other MR action shots you all out there have. I've seen some pretty cool ones over time, and I'd love to see more. So if you've uh, you know, got an interesting use case that you've seen, if you have a, an odd location, maybe you're walking around, you see an MR access point laying about somewhere, somewhere strange. I've seen Saran Wrap 
in the past. That's a, not a recommended outdoor deployment configuration, but I have seen it. Uh, <laughs> or if maybe there's just some good mood lighting because the light strikes the access points just yeah, right. Feel free to dress it up. You know, you know pa paper, paper dolls. Yeah. I mean, really, the, the possibilities are limitless, and we'd love to see what sort of action shots that you may be able to find. So uh, if, if you find a good one, tweet out your MR selfie. Uh, mention at Meraki so that we can see it. Do this before the, uh, the end of next week. And uh, the favorite one, most importantly, you get a prize for this, and you can get a, a fine, fine pair of our limited edition Rocky socks. You can't see it. I'm wearing them right now. They are sexy. I like it. So uh, send us a selfie. You can get yourself your own snazzy pair of Rocky socks. Send them a selfie. Well, I don't know where to go after that. Um, fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Neither do we. We, we, are, we are continuously asked for uh, these Meraki socks by almost everybody who sees them. So uh, trust me, this is definitely worth uh, entering if you'd like to. Uh, right, we'd like to spend a few moments. Thank you, Paul. We'd like to spend a few moments uh, just sharing a few of the common questions that we've received for each of the product categories uh, that have come in. So uh, what I'm going to do for this, I'm going to ask each one of the of the team here. Uh, to step up to the mic in the order that we presented in, uh, just to maybe just recap some of the common questions that have come in. And so we're going to start with MX, and Raviv has magically turned into our very own Joe Aranel, uh, who has, I think, already answered quite a few of the questions that came in on MX. But uh, Joe, could you just share with us some of the more typical kind of questions that we received? Thanks. Yeah, we got a, a couple different questions about AMP, um, so I want to touch on that briefly, just to give you guys an idea. Let me actually go out here and pull up the questions so I make sure I remember them properly. Oh, or better yet, Paul is all over that. So first things first, uh, I got a question about threat grid licensing. So just to be clear, while AMP is included in the advanced security license, um, threat grid does require a separate license. And there will be more details coming about that as we get closer to that launch. Uh, so stay tuned for that. AMP is included, no extra cost. ThreatGrid does require a ThreatGrid license. We're working with the ThreatGrid team to iron out the details of that, and that information will be coming soon. Um, several questions about templates. So I, I want to kind of just let you guys know we are doing a lot of work on enhancing the flexibility of configuration templates. So there will be more that you can do with those around exceptions, around more flexible addressing, um, which are two of the things that came up in the, in the Q&A panel. I don't have details about when or exactly what we'll be providing, but it is something that there is a team of engineers working on. We are planning to add more flexibility and more enhanced functionality around that. And then finally, I have someone who is, I think, a little bit upset that AMP is not coming to the Z1. So I just want to clarify the distinction there. Um, the Z1 is going to continue to get new features. There seems to be a concern that you know the new features that are coming out focus more on the MX and the Z1 is sort of being left to the side. It's not really the case. It's just more that the features we happen to have provided recently either fall under the advanced security license, such as AMP, or fall under the heading of you need two uplinks, like IWAN, in order to take advantage of them. So that's why the Z1 hasn't really been part of the last couple feature releases. But that doesn't mean that as new features that are relevant for the Z1 continue to come out, that it won't be included in those. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Tony and let him do his thing. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks, Joe. So on the switch, I saw a few questions uh, particularly related to the stacking capabilities. And I wanted to just clarify that on the 410, being that it's a one gig aggregation product, um, we decided to give it dedicated stacking interfaces. Um, there is uh, hardware capabilities to allow for it to stack with the 350. It doesn't do this today, but please share your use case for that. We are interested in kind of learning more about what those use cases look like, and certainly we uh, we will look at what that will take if we decide it makes sense. The other thing I saw a few questions on was uh, stacking bandwidth on the 420 when we release what I gave a sneak preview of. Um, that is coming out in uh, beta very soon, and essentially it's it's really uh, stack it your way. And what I mean by that is once you get uh, the update via the cloud that enables this functionality, you can choose uh, to go with our recommended pair of 10 gig stacking. And this would mean that you have uh, 40 gigabits per second of bidirectional stacking bandwidth by taking two of the front port SFP plus ports on your pair of 420s and turning them into stacking links and interconnecting them using whatever technology you want. 
Someone mentioned that that sounds a lot like horizontal stacking. And basically, it is. It means that you can take whatever media type you want, whatever SFP plus uh, type you want, whether it's twin X passive, whether it's uh, active fiber. And this allows for you to have a very, very flexible deployment approach where you can have the two 420s in disparate locations, two different closets, and you can interconnect them and stack them together. So very, very cool, very easy, you know, Meraki easy and uh, and you know, very excited about that particular feature. Uh, I saw a few other questions about templates. I think in general they were more focused on the uh, ability to do role-based type access control. Meraki Dashboard has a few different uh, roles in that you can have full admin at the network level, at the organizational level. Uh, for templates you would need to have network, uh, excuse me, organizational level admin control meaning that you can uh, basically configure and manage any network within a Meraki organization. And uh, you also can use port-based access control. And this means that you can use a label and apply that label to just some of your ports on a particular switch or some ports on a particular profile. And any user with that role will only be allowed to configure and make changes to those ports. So it's fairly flexible. Um, but if you have other needs and, uh, and use cases, certainly share those with us. And I think that about covers the questions that we had on the MS. Uh, so with that, I will pop it over to Paul. Yeah, buddy. Thank you, Tony. Hello again, everybody. Thanks for putting up with me. Maybe we'll sing a song a little bit later. Was that a wow? Is the very white. No. Um, all right, thanks for the good questions. Something that I heard several times um, that I'll, I'll go over live here is people asking about if they work on if uh, you can have a device check into systems manager off-site so just to give a little bit about the architecture there uh, systems manager actually doesn't require any hardware on-premise equipment or servers in order to communicate with the devices or for the devices to communicate to the cloud they'll actually just check in directly so whereas we definitely have uh, a lot of functionality with our integration on the network that can forward devices to enroll in the first place. Um, you actually, you, you don't need them to be on site to keep checking in or to enroll at all. You can basically send a link. Uh, if, you have, if you're a part of the Apple device enrollment program, you can just have them automatically enroll anywhere in the world. So any internet connection they have, whether that's 3G, 4G, something like that, they will continue to check in. Uh, and another one that's pretty cool, we have a couple questions about how to do geofencing. And one of the ones that came up is uh, you, you do have the ability to do network location overrides. That's on the configure general page. And basically what that does is that makes it so that you can say, if a device is checking in from this public IP address or use CIDR, CIDR notation to say what range of IP addresses you want to be using, then you can actually override the physical location. So in that case, they're connected to these access points. You actually update which geolocation they're on. Maybe you're not using GPS or the device doesn't support it. Uh, that helps you in that scenario. So um, so that was one. Another one was about limited access roles. Well, actually, it was about administration, but one of our answers for that is limited access roles, where basically with the same tagging that I've been talking about the whole time, uh, basically the ability to say what kind of user this is. Uh, we also integrate with LDAP groups, things like that. You can actually create custom administrative roles on that too. And that would basically look like uh, for example, in, corporate, in um, an enterprise or commercial is, let's say you have an asset management team. You can basically add a tag and have all these devices that are your assets, and then administrators only have access to those assets. And then you can also say only between 8 and 5 or 9 and 6. Or if this is a teacher, then you can say, you know, between third period, fourth period, they only have access to science devices or something of that sort. So with the tags, you can actually get very creative and granular with the different access roles. And with that, punting back to Matt. Matt, is it time for some more debate about how to pronounce Boo Mimo? Oh, yeah, no, I think we beat that cow. Uh, 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 uh,
So we uh, we have a couple of folks asking about what the uh, what the MR42 means for the MR34. Is the MR34 still available? And the answer is absolutely yes. The MR34 is still available. MR34 is a venerable access point that uh, has been at the top of the Meraki portfolio for uh, since the introduction of 11AC. And we have a lot of customers who have invested in that platform and they want to continue expanding their MR34 network and absolutely should consider doing so. Now that said, we also have folks that uh, have started investing in MR32 networks. They want to expand them and want to know if they can expand with MR42s. The answer is, once again, yes. One of the beauties of the Meraki networking architecture is that you can easily mix and match AP types. You can choose perhaps areas of a, of a building of a deployment that have higher density clients and would benefit from higher density capability access points. You can absolutely deploy those. The management, the dashboard is the same. The Meraki AP licenses are the same. They carry over, so you should feel free to mix and match depending on your needs, giving you an unprecedented level of flexibility with deploying new technology, especially like 11AC Man, Wave 2. I, it does sound too good to be true, and, and the catch, that's the thing. I can't think of one. Wow. So I, I think th those tend to be the most critical questions that we get. Uh, somebody else asked uh, about uh, AC adapters. We actually did launch a new AC adapter to go along with the MR42. Uh, we, it is a higher power AP, utilizes the full range of 802.3 AT PoE powering. So we launched a new AC adapter uh, to satisfy that power usage. Uh, and I think maybe worth mentioning since we're here, uh, we had also announced the uh, pending end of life of the MR26. So that, that uh, device is no longer for sale and we've trimmed the portfolio a little bit, and uh, I think that makes sense given the overwhelming adoption of 802.11ac, uh, starting to see those .11n networks oh, starting to fade. Overwhelming. overwhelming. Good, good exactly, my diction is acute. Awesome. I, <laughs> all right, I think with that, we've, uh, we've covered off all of the key questions, so I'll hand it off to Simon before we wrap up. Wow, that's been quite a session. We've covered a lot of ground in the last, what is it, 55 minutes. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found that useful. It is quite a challenge getting these product managers together in a room uh, once a quarter and just getting the material. They're very busy people, so we're very grateful to them for, uh, for spending the time with us. Hope you found the session useful. Uh, so as always, please use the usual channels to reach out to us uh, with any follow-up questions. And we look forward to welcoming you back on the next quarterly. Uh, where we'll have certainly some very exciting new things to share with you. So thanks for joining. See you next time. Bye-bye for now.